Okay, so we're there in Matthew chapter number 22, and tonight's sermon is going to be a little bit different than normal. Um, normally, at a Bible study on, on a Thursday, we generally go verse by verse through a chapter, and on Sundays, I normally focus on a single passage or a single topic. Um, as I was writing the sermon, it kind of ended up being a combination of the two, so um, there is a common theme I'm going to focus on as we go through the chapter, but we're actually going to go through the entire chapter, so as well as go to a lot of other places. So the, the title of the sermon tonight comes from verse number 29. Verse number 29, Jesus answered, said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. Ye do err, not knowing the Scriptures. That's, that's the title of the sermon, you do err, not knowing the Scriptures. So we'll jump back to the start of the chapter, verse number 1 of, 22, of chapter 22. Look at verse number 1. He says, And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables, and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son. And sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. So the study is saying, look, this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. This is what the kingdom of heaven is like. It's actually like a wedding invitation. So it's like the king, you know, you've got a king over a kingdom, and he's, and he's, he's having a marriage for his son, and he sends forth his servants. And he says, you know, to call people that were bidden to the wedding, but they don't come. So that's what it's like. Going to heaven, it's like people are invited, but most people, it says... They don't come. It's like they refuse the invitation. They don't want to pay any attention to the invitation. Look down at verse number four. It says, Again he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I've prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. So notice he says here, look, everything's ready. I've prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatlings are killed. All things are ready. So what it's saying is, it's just saying that everything is ready. It's not that there's something that you need to bring. I don't know if you've ever been invited to, someone's invited you over their place for like a potluck dinner, you know, um, you know like a, one of those ones where you bring a plate. It's you bring your plate. That's not what this is like. Being saved is not like, see, a lot of people that we talk to, they think that going to heaven, it's a bring a plate. You've got to bring your own good works. You've got to bring your own righteousness. That's what they think. But that's not what it's like, because isn't this what it's talking about? This is what the kingdom of heaven is like. And he says, all things are ready. Okay? I mean, Jesus has done everything that was required to pay for our sins. He's done everything completely, you know, to give us his righteousness. I mean, have a, have a look, keep your finger in Matthew 22, but look in um, 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5 and verse number 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number, um, look at verse number 20. It says, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So notice what it's saying here. It's saying, look, he's made him, that's Jesus, to be sin for us. Jesus took our sin upon himself. But not only that, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So Jesus took our sin on him, but also he gave us his righteousness. Okay, and it's just, it's received by faith. But then, I mean, if we look earlier on, it's like, but now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God to beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. So God has saved us, we've believed the message, and so Jesus' righteousness is given to us, and our sin is put upon him. But he's also said, well, you're now ambassadors. You need to go and speak on Christ's behalf and tell people that message. You know, that's why he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Okay, so it's an important thing. We are ambassadors for Christ. That's the, that's the work that he's given us to do. Now, whether we do that or not has nothing to do with us being saved. Being saved is just it's accepting the free gift that God, that God offers us. Okay? Um, actually, look at Philippians chapter number 3. Philippians chapter 3, verse number 9. See, Paul understood this. Paul understood that it had nothing to do with his righteousness. Philippians chapter number 3, and verse number 9, it says, And be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Notice that? That's how we receive our righteousness. It's from God, and it's received by faith. It's received by believing. Let's look back in um, Matthew 22. Matthew 22, verse number 5. Okay, so they've been invited. Everyone's been invited. Everything's ready. But then what happens? Verse number 5. But they made light of it, and they went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. So they, they ignored the invitation. And that's, that's a fact. As you preach the gospel to people, a lot of people, I mean, the majority of people, are going to ignore the invitation, sadly. Verse number six. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. 
So here we see, you know, people ignore the invitation, but then not only do they ignore the invitation, they sometimes persecute the messengers. They sometimes persecute the messengers. And sometimes that can be one of the reasons why people think, well, I don't really want to tell people the message, I don't want to get persecution. Now, in the country we live in, in New Zealand, it's not major persecution. You know, you might be, you might be mocked or laughed at or something, but it's not. I mean, there are countries in the world where you do that and they'll do what it says here. You know, they, they took his servants and, and treated them spitefully and slew them. You know, you try preaching the gospel in Iran, for example. What's going to happen to you over there? You know, and so there are places, and hey, it's only a matter of time before it's going to happen here too. It's going to happen all over the world. I mean, Jesus, that's a whole other topic, but Jesus talked about that in, in Matthew chapter 24, about what's going to happen. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> but what he's saying here, he's saying, look, this is what happened. They took his servants and they treated them spitefully. They slew them. In fact, Jesus said that. If you look at, um, keep your finger again in Matthew 22, but look at John chapter number 15. Look at John chapter number 15. This is what Jesus said to his disciples. John chapter number 15 and verse number 20. Jesus said, John 15, 20, page 1085. He says, remember the word that I said unto you. The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they've persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Well, did they persecute Jesus? Yeah, they did. If they've kept my saying, they will keep yours also. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin. But now they have no cloak for their sin. He that hateth me, hateth my father also. He says, look, if you hate me, guess what? You hate my father also. If I had not done among them the works which none of them did, they had not had sin. But now have they both seen and hated both me and my father. But this cometh to pass that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law, they hated me without a cause. And the fact is, if you love Jesus, if you're serving him, people will hate you for no reason. That's just because Jesus said, look, they did it to me, and if you're my servant, if you're following me, they'll do it to you as well. Look at chapter 16, verse 1, he says, these things have I spoken unto you that ye should, should not be offended. He says, look, so that when it, when it happens, I don't want you to be offended. Don't be surprised what's going on here. They shall put you out of the synagogues. They might put you out of the churches. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. And these things will they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. So understand, there's persecution that will come. And that's what we saw back in Matthew 22. If you flip back there, the messengers were sent, and some of them were taken, and they were treated spitefully, and they were even killed. Look in verse number 7. Verse number 7. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies, and destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. And so we see here, the, the destruction comes. The destruction comes because they weren't worthy. Now, historically, we can look back and we can see that, you know, obviously Jesus came to the, came to the Jews originally, didn't he? And what happened to Jerusalem? It was destroyed. 70 AD, you know, the, the emperor, was it Titus or something, I think, came in and basically destroyed the whole place. Okay? Um, and in fact, we actually see that if we look in John again, John chapter number 1, John chapter number 1, John chapter number 1 and verse number 10, John chapter number 1 and verse 10, speaking about Jesus, it says he was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. And then it says he came unto his own, and his own received him not. So he came to his own people, he came to the Jewish people. They didn't receive him. But, verse 12, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So notice that. Some people did believe. Some people did receive him. If you turn back to Matthew chapter number 22, we saw destruction came because these people, they weren't worthy. But those, you know, I mean, those who were called, understanding, those who were called weren't worthy because none of us have, have, have good works. None of us have good works that we can merit salvation. Okay? But it's interesting, in the parallel passage to Matthew chapter 22, in Luke chapter 20, in Luke chapter 20, where it talks about the, the thing that's later on in... Um, as we're going to get to in Matthew 22. And Luke chapter 20 and verse number 34, Luke chapter 20 and verse number 34, it says, And Jesus answering said unto them, The children of this world marry, and are given in marriage, but they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage, neither can they die anymore, for they are equal unto the angels, and are the children of God, being the children of the resurrection. So notice here, being worthy... It's actually being worthy to obtain that world in the resurrection requires you to be a child of God. And of course, how do you become a child of God? Well, we saw that back in John chapter 1. But as many as received, you know, as many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that do what? Believe 
on his name. Okay, so that's what's going on here. So when he went to them, they weren't worthy. They didn't receive him, and um, they ended up, you know, they ended up being destroyed. Okay, and so that's what what they needed to do is they needed to believe. And in fact, Jesus actually said that he even talked about when you see Jerusalem surrounded, head for the hills, and the people that believed they took off. You know, so they didn't fall in that destruction. Okay, um, back in Matthew chapter twenty-two, verse number nine. Verse number nine, he says, Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. Okay? So these first people, they didn't receive it. You know, that they persecuted those people who were sent. And then he says, Look, this is what's going to happen. The city's going to be destroyed, burnt up. Um, those people weren't worthy. He says, Go into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So that's obviously talking to us about what are we supposed to do? Go into the highways and hedges. Compel them to come in. He says, we're supposed to go out and preach the gospel. You know, Mark chapter Mark chapter 16 and verse number 15. Mark chapter 16 and verse number 15 says, Go ye, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's a command. It's like one of the last commands Jesus gave before he left. He said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. This is what we see here, the parallel in Matthew 22, 9. He says, look, go into the highways and, and as many as you shall find, bid to the marriage. Invite them to the marriage. Give them that invitation. Verse number 10. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good. And the wedding was furnished with guests. Notice this is here, bad and good. Everyone is bidden. It's not just for some exclusive few. It's everyone. The bad are bidden and the good are bidden. Everyone. You know, people have this idea, oh, it's just good people who go to heaven. No. Everyone is invited. The bad people are invited and the good people are invited. And we understand the Bible says none, there is none good but one. That is God. We understand that. But within our human understanding, there is different levels of, of badness and goodness. You know, that's just sort of pretty straightforward. So he found, look, bad and good in the wedding was furnished with yes. You know, it's not, it wasn't just for some exclusive few. You see, some people have this idea that there's a select few that God's chosen. That these select few, those are the ones who are going to be saved. No, have a look at 1 Timothy chapter number 2. 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter number 2, 1 Timothy chapter number 2, and verse number, verse number 3, 1 Timothy 2, verse 3 says, For this is good and accept in the sight of God our Saviour, who will have, how many? All men to be saved, and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all, to be testified in due time. Turn over the page and look at um, chapter number 4. Chapter number 4 and verse number 9, chapter number 4, verse 9 says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, for therefore we both labour and suffer approach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Saviour of all men, especially of those that believe. You see, the Bible teaches that God is the saviour of all men. Now, does that mean that everybody ends up going to heaven? No, it doesn't. You know, turn to the end and you'll see people being cast like a fire. You know, people, some people sadly end up going to hell. But is it because God desired that? No. The Bible says that, you know, the everlasting fire was prepared for the devil as angels. It wasn't prepared for us. It wasn't prepared for anyone that goes there. God wants all to be saved. In fact, it says in um, 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter number 3, 2 Peter chapter number 3 and verse number 9, 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. See, some people wonder, how long is it going to be? When's he going to come back? When's he going to come back? The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us. With God is patient. He's, he's waiting. He's long suffering. Not willing means he's not desiring that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God desires that no one should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Some people say, oh look, all should come to repentance. That's what you've got to do to be saved. You've got to repent of your sins. Is that what it said? No. It said, come to repentance. Repentance in the Bible means change. Okay, repentance means change. There is a change that people need to make in order to be saved. What they need to do is they need to change from whatever they're trusting in, their works is what the average person's trusting in, maybe they're trusting in some false religion, that needs to change to trust in Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus said in Mark chapter 1, he says, you know, the time is fulfilled, he says, repent ye and believe the gospel. Change and believe the gospel. I mean, that, that lady I was speaking to this morning, that, that got saved, she was trusting in the, the good life that she was living. She was trusting in, she said, I gave my heart to God, I, I did this, These are what, this is what it's all about. But when she saw it was just believe, her view had to change. For her to be saved, she had to repent. 
She had to repent of what she was believing before and change to trust that Jesus paid it all. Paid for her past sins, her present sins, and her future sins. You see, because some people have this, oh, sure, we understand salvation is not by works. A lot of people understand because they've read it in the Bible. For by grace you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, as any man should boast. A lot of people understand, oh, yeah, not of works. Not of... But you talk to a Jehovah's Witness, they'll say it's not of works. But you've got to do the works. You know, and so that, that, that's a crazy thing. So a lot of people understand, okay, you, you don't have to do works to get saved, but I mean, surely you've got to do works to stay saved. Well, I mean, the thing is, if, there was some, if you could lose your salvation, you would lose your salvation. That's just, that's just a simple fact, okay? But that's why we don't trust in ourselves, but we trust in the living God who is the saviour of all men. Okay, um, where would we, we get up to? Oh, back in, back in Matthew chapter 22, Matthew chapter 22, verse number... Verse number 11, Matthew chapter 22, verse number 11. <coughs> and when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. Notice that. He says, someone here doesn't have a wedding garment. Now, it's interesting, the wedding garment, this is what you're supposed to wear when you're at um, the wedding. You know, he's, he's supposed to have a wedding garment. Well, let's have a look at this. Um, remember we saw before Paul said, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law? Look at Revelation chapter number 19. Revelation chapter 19 and verse number, Revelation 19, verse number 7, Revelation 19 and verse number 7, Revelation 19 verse 7 says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honour to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife had made herself ready, and to her was granted that, that, that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. So what's the fine linen? This clean, white, fine linen. What's the, what's the wedding garment you need on? The righteousness of saints. That, well, that's what it says in the King James Bible, is the righteousness of saints. Paul says, not having my own righteousness. So what's this righteousness? But the righteousness of, which is of God. It's by faith in Jesus Christ. Now, if you get a modern Bible, many of them, the New King James, for example, there, says it's the righteous deeds or the righteous acts of the saints is what it is. What's that really saying? In the New King James, it's changed. Instead of being the righteousness which comes from Christ, it's our good deeds. Yeah. That's what we're juicing ourselves in. No, that's not what the Bible says. And that's why it's important that we shouldn't change the Bible. You see, I mean, I try to explain this to, I mean, children understand this. I say, look, is the Bible a new book or is the Bible an old book? And a child will tell you the Bible's an old book. Well, if I've got a Bible that's called the New King James, is that the Bible? How can it be? It's new. Well, this is not, this is old. You know, this is over 400 years old. And even having said that, that's just when it was translated into English and it was just bringing what they already had. It's not that they, that was a new thing then. It was just bringing, you know, in fact, that was, that's what actually what it says. Um, you know, it was just, they were just um, basically, because there had been previous, you know, translations in English done before that. But the previous translations, if you look at them, they, you know, some of them weren't too, some of them were terrible, but some of them weren't too bad. But these, what they did, they, they were making something that was good even better because they would make it more accurate to what the original said. Okay? So, key thing to understand, you know, if you want to keep good doctrine, you need to stay on the, the King James Bible. Back in Matthew chapter number 22, verse number 12. Matthew chapter 22, verse number 12. <coughs> Matthew chapter 22, verse number 12. He said, and he saith unto him, so remember, this is a person who doesn't have on the wedding garment. He says, friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. So notice that. It's what? If he doesn't have the garment, the wedding garment, is he saved? No. He's cast away. Okay, so you, you've got to have Christ, Christ's righteousness. Otherwise, no wedding garment, then there's no salvation. And understand, I mean, we understand that many people, so he came there, he came to the wedding, didn't he? He came there, he heard the invitation, but instead of responding the right way, he came bringing his own works. He came bringing his own stuff, and he was cast out of darkness. And the fact is, there are a lot of people who think they're going to go to heaven, and they're really not. Matthew chapter number 7 talks about Jesus said, many will say to him in that day, you know, he actually said, you know, people are going to say, Lord, Lord. Um, he actually, well, let's turn there. Turn to Matthew chapter number 7, because we're quite close. Matthew chapter number 7. Matthew chapter number 7 and verse number 21. Not everyone, that's what I was thinking of. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. He says, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. So not everybody's going to go, going to enter into the kingdom of heaven, but the person who does the will of the Father. 
Many will say to him in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied or preached in thy name? And thy name have cast out devils, and thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So he's saying, look, many people are going to expect to go to heaven. They're saying, Jesus is my Lord. They're expecting to get to heaven. And they're saying, what? I've done this. I've done that. You know, I've been to a Baptist church all my life. I've been out. I've gone soul winning. I've, I've read my Bible. I've, I've stopped doing this. I've stopped doing that. I'm coming in, aren't I? Guess what that is? That's the wrong wedding garment. The right wedding garment is Jesus died to pay for my sins. My trust is 100% in him, 0% in me. That's what the, that's what the right wedding garment is. Okay. Um, <clears throat> turn back to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter number 22. Verse number 15. Matthew chapter 22, verse number 15. <clears throat> then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. And they sent out unto him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Master, we know that thou art true, and teachest the way of God in truth. Neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of men. Tell us therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? They say, hey, look, can we, can we pay tax to Caesar, or, or couldn't we? And understand, you know, they're actually trying to entangle him in his talk. They're trying to trap him. Okay? Verse number 18. But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt me, ye hypocrites? Um, show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny. And he saith unto them, Whose is this image and superscription? They say unto him, Caesar's. Then saith unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. When they had heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. So they try and trap him in his talk. But it doesn't work, you see, because God's words are irrefutable. You know? God's words are irrefutable. What Jesus said, it can't be answered. In fact, there's actually many people historically who have tried to refute the Bible. They've set out to prove the Bible wrong, and they've ended up getting saved because of it. Okay? They've, they've tried to pro prove, oh, well, Jesus didn't really rise from the dead. They've gone to prove it. It's like, kind of looks like he did. You know, and many, many people have, 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 have um, gone through that experience historically. But let's let's move on. Verse number twenty-three. Verse number twenty-three. The same day came to him the Sadducees, which say that there is no resurrection, and asked him, saying, "Master, Moses said, if a man die <coughs> having no children, his, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother." So the Sadducees have come. They say there is no resurrection, and now they're asked. They're, they're sort of questioning him, trying to trip him up. Say, look, you say this. We don't believe there's a resurrection, and we're going to prove that we're right. Okay? So he says, look, if a man die having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now, there were with us seven brethren. And the first, when he had married a wife, deceased, he died. And having no issue, he had no children, left his wife unto his brother. Likewise, the second also, and the third unto the seventh. So, I mean, you'd kind of suspect there's something going on with this woman if all her husbands are dying one after another. It's, and it's obviously just a made-up story, okay? They make up the story. But they're saying, look, this is what happens. So first she's married to this brother, no children, he dies. So the next one marries. And because the, the, the sort of concept was beside her was that what would happen is that the first child they had would have the name of the older brother. So that name wouldn't be sort of, you know, done away with, etc. But so supposedly all seven married, they all die, um... Verse number 27, the last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, see, they're trying to get him here, in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. They were all married to her. So in the resurrection, whose wife she going to be? What, is she, is she going to have seven husbands? That's what they're trying to do, to trip him up. Verse 29, Jesus answered, said unto them, ye do err. He's saying, look, you're in error. You're mistaken. He says, you do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. So they're in error, and there's a reason why they're in error. It's because they don't know the scriptures, neither the power of God. So, you know, these people, they try and confound them with questions, but he shows the problem with them is that they don't know the Bible. And that's the fact. That's the problem that everyone can get into. You're in error. Why? Because we don't know the Bible. Now, is there anyone who knows the Bible perfectly? No, there's not. But that's why we should be continually reading. We should be continually learning and growing you know, in, gra in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We should be in this word. That's why we encourage it. I mean, we're in the, it's the middle, we've just started, it's only the fourth today. Bible March. In the month of March, we try and read the entire New Testament. Nine chapters a day, read through the whole New Testament, and, you know, take out, have a lovely slap out meal and stuff like that. So, but really, the reason for doing it is not because of the reward you're going to get there, because you get a much greater reward by actually reading those nine chapters. You know? And that's the thing, is that many people, they're like, they're the equivalent of like some starving person. Like you probably, you know, think of people starving in some country where there's famine and they're, you know, they're, they're, they're malnourished. Well, that's what the average Christian is like. Because Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, 
but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. And so this is what we need, but the average Christian is like someone who's starving. They're malnourished. They're, if you could see them with spiritual eyes, they'd be like, you know, anorexic. They'd be wasting away. So we, we need God's word. We need to be in God's word and reading God's word. <coughs> and he says, also just notice in passing, he says, you do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. And so the power of God, he said, don't know the scriptures, nor the power of God. The power, and this is one thing. When you read the Bible like a, a lot, you discover, it's like you read a, a phrase, it, that's really familiar, I've read that here. I've read that here. When you hear the power of God, that reminds me of Romans chapter 1. Have a look at Romans chapter 1 and verse number 16. Romans chapter 1 and verse number 16. Romans chapter 1 and verse number 16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. See, so I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation. So what is the power of God? It's the gospel. So when it says here, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God, they don't know the scriptures and they don't know the power of God. They don't know the gospel. These people are unsaved. Which obviously they were. They're Sadducees. They come and say, they don't believe there's a resurrection. They don't believe this. They didn't believe Jesus was God. Okay, so these people are unsaved. And so that's the problem because they don't know the gospel. And the fact is that people who are unsaved, they're not really going to understand the Bible. They're not going to understand them. People wonder why there's so much false religion in the world. Because there's many people who are unsaved who are teaching the Bible. And they'll teach nonsense. They'll teach absolute nonsense. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. 1 Corinthians chapter number 2 and verse number 12. 1 Corinthians 2, 12 says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. It's the Bible, spiritual things. The Bible is a spiritual book. Okay, and when he says comparing spiritual, that's comparing the Bible with the Bible. Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Verse number 14, though, it says, but the natural man, this is like the unsaved person, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. So the unsaved person... You know, it's like, it's, it's like a veil. In fact, I think it says that. Have a look at 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, it says, there's a veil when people aren't saved and they read the Bible. It talks about the Jews here. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter number 3. A lot of people, they like to think, I'm going to go and find out stuff. In order to understand the Bible, I need to go back to some, some Jewish rabbi and understand, you know, what, what the culture was like and what the customs were. And that, that's going to help me to understand. Well, do they understand the Bible? Have a look and see what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter number 3, verse number 13. 2 Corinthians chapter number 3 and verse 13 says, And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished, but their minds were blinded. For until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. So when the Old Testament is read to an unsaved Jew, guess what? They've got a veil. They don't see it. Which veil, however, is done away in Christ. So when they get saved, then the veil is lifted and they can see. Um... But until, but even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. So when they turn to Christ, when they understand, then they get taken away. And that's the reason why, it's quite an important thing. Back in verse number 12, this is a fantastic verse, verse 12. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. It's important to use plain speech. A lot of people, when they're trying to explain stuff, they, they very much, they, 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 they won't say things clearly. When the Bible says something clearly, we should say it clearly. I mean, this morning I was preaching on alcohol. I was preaching on the Bible. It's, it's a sin. We should not drink alcohol at all. It's not a case of drinking in moderation. You know, a lot of people drink in moderation. No, not at all. That's not what the Bible teaches. And so we need to make it really clear. Now, having said that, um, there is... Some people say, oh, well, you're just like a, you know, a legalistic church. You've got these rules and regulations. You've got to, you've got to have these laws that you've got to follow. Well... If you look in, um, back in, still in 2 Corinthians 3, it says, Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. You see, there's freedom. We don't have rules and regulations in this church that you have to abide by. There's not. Okay. Now, there are some things that we get you thrown out of church. I mean, the Bible does talk about that in 2 Corinthians 5. If someone is a drunk, you know, if someone's a fornicator, if someone's doing this, there are certain things that people should be thrown out of church for. But that doesn't mean you have to agree with every guy. Do- if, if someone thought that social drinking was okay... Not, not drinking, not to be a drunk, but if they had a glass of oil, hey, it's none of my business. I'll, I'll preach what the Bible says, they'll probably, they'll probably get sick of it, but the fact is that, you know, there's freedom. 
You know, and so that's my job is to preach what the Bible says and to preach it clearly, not to beat around the bush, but to actually be clear and say it. Okay, back in um, oh, that's right. So we're talking about remember how the unsaved person doesn't understand the Bible. We see a great example of this in Acts chapter number eight. Acts chapter number eight. Philip um, going through the desert meets the Ethiopian eunuch. Acts chapter number 8, verse number 30, says, And Philip ran thither to him, and heard him read the prophet Isaiah, and, and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? So this guy's sitting there reading the book of Isaiah. And Philip goes up to him and says, Do you understand what you're reading? Verse 31, And he said, How can I, except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip they would come up and sit with him. And so the unsaved person, they, they, they need a believer, like Philip was, to come up and explain to him, and if we, we won't bother going through, but he preaches him the gospel. He, from that scripture, he started and preached from Jesus. He believed, he got saved, he got baptized. You know, these are straightforward. That's what it should be. Okay, let's get back where we are. Okay, back in Matthew chapter 20. We're going to hurry up. Matthew chapter 22. <coughs> Matthew chapter 22 and verse number 20. Oh, yeah, we're going to 29. Jesus answered, said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. That was the problem. Nor the power of God. And then what he says, look, he says, look, from the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. He says, look, you don't know the, the scriptures, you don't know the Bible. In the resurrection, they don't marry. They're not given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. So he's saying, look, it's not a case of, well, whose who's wife is, is, you know, who's going to have her for as their wife, seven brothers and her, because none of them are married. There is no marriage in heaven. Okay? It, it's... When we're married, it says, till death do us part. Till death do us part. But in, in heaven, there is no marriage. And that's what the whole thing the Mormons teach. They talk about this, this sort of celestial marriage. Well, what does the Bible say? You do err, not knowing the scriptures. The Bible says no. So Jesus corrects the error. Then look at verse number 31. Verse number 31. He says, But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. So he goes on and corrects more false teaching that they hold to. Okay, because some people have this idea that people who don't believe in a resurrection, they believe, oh, when you die, you know, and even some people who do believe in a resurrection, they say, when you die, it's just like you're just asleep. You know? And then it's not until the end. But he says, no, look, God, he says, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Okay, so you understand. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, when Jesus was speaking this, were they dead or were they alive? They're alive. They weren't lying on the ground. Okay? Um, I mean, it says in John 11, verse 25, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? That's a great question to ask people. Do you? But when Jesus said, if you live and believe in me, you will never die. Do you believe that? Hey, that's what he says. You know, he says, now your body will die. But, you know, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. The saved believe, they go straight to heaven. Okay. Um, all right, let's get back to Matthew 22, um, verse number 33. Verse number 33. And when the multitude heard this, they were astonished at his doctrine. So people, they're amazed when they hear Jesus teaching. We see that over and over again. Back in chapter 7, verse 28, it says that it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Jesus taught as someone had authority. Why? Because it was based on this is what God's word says. And that should be enough. If God's word says it, that's it. Okay, a lot of people go, oh, well, maybe this, maybe that, maybe that. Now, is it true there are some things that we're, that we're not certain of? Yeah, for sure. But there's a lot of things that are really clear, that are really absolutely blatant. There's no, there's no two ways about it. I mean, a prime example we see where, um, uh, think about churches that would have a, a woman pastor, a woman preacher. I mean, how obvious is that within scriptures? You know, we're not going to turn there and do it, but I've preached on it many times. The Bible makes it really clear. The Bible says, But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And the, and the Bible even says, It's a shame for a woman to speak in the church. It's not a place for a woman to be standing up here preaching. Say, if I was sick, would my wife come up here and preach instead of me? No. Now, my wife knows the Bible a lot. She's read the Bible a lot of times. She'd have great things she could share, share with you. But God says no. Okay? There's different things. Men and women. Understand. It's a matter of roles. It's not, I'm not saying that men are better than women. Not at all. What I'm saying is that they're different. You know, it's like a, it's like a, it's like a, like a washing machine and a, and a dishwasher. You know, you can have these two appliances. You have a washing machine, you have a dishwasher. They're not the same. You try putting your clothes into the dishwasher. 
It's not going to work very well. You know, try putting your dishes in the washing machine. That's going to be pretty bad as well, okay? They're different. Men and women are different. I can't be a mother to my children. And she can't be a father to my children, okay? But she's a great mum, and it's fantastic the job that she does with them, you know? I mean, and, and, you know, that, that's why there's so many, in fact, there's so many different scriptures. Here's, I wasn't going to go there, but I just will go there because it's, it's important we understand what God says and we believe what God says. Remember I talked about plainness of speech? This is something that many people won't say. They won't say. Look at Titus chapter number 2. Titus chapter number 2. It says that the age woman likewise, they be in behaviours, become a holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young woman to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Now, is that pretty clear? It's like you're saying, look, this is what you're supposed to teach them. To be sober, obviously, to love their husbands, yeah, to love their children. But it says, look, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home. The Bible says that the, the place of a woman is in the home. We live in a world today where that's, that's weird. If someone says, look, you know, I think the best thing is for, for a woman to stay home and look after her kids and raise her kids. Now, if you went back 30 years ago, that was normal. 40 years ago, that was a normal thing. There are still some cultures where it's still the norm, where the husband goes out and works. And the Bible, once again, the Bible says that it's part of the curse. What was the man supposed to do? Work by the sweat of his brow. That's what's supposed to happen. The man's supposed to work to provide. In fact, the Bible also says in, in Timothy, he says, um, but if any provide not for his own, especially those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. The Bible says, that if, says if a man will not work, neither should he eat. If someone's not prepared to work, if a man's not prepared to work, if he's not prepared to feed his family, he shouldn't eat. Okay, that's, the Bible says it. And I believe it. Okay, and so, I'm not sure how I got on that, but anyway. Um, oh yeah, with authority. If the Bible says it, then that's enough. Okay, back in Matthew chapter 22, verse number 34. Matthew chapter 22, verse number 34. <coughs> Matthew chapter 22, verse number 34 says, But when the Pharisees had heard that he put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him, and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So he's saying, look, all of God's commandments can be summed up in two expressions. Love God and love, love your neighbour. That, that sums it all up. If you love God and love your neighbour, you've fulfilled the law. That's the whole thing. Now some people sort of will take that and say, oh, it's like, I just need to love God, have this feeling towards God. You know, I have this, this feeling, you know, I love my neighbour, yeah. No. Because there's a close connection between loving and God's commandments. And the fact is, in fact, look at, keep your finger in Matthew 22, but look at 1 John chapter number 5. 1 John chapter number 5. 1 John chapter number 5. <clears throat> verse number 1 says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. What do you have to do to be saved? Believe. And then it says, and everyone that loveth him that begat, everyone that loves God, loveth him also that is begotten of him. He says, if you love God, then you can love your fellow believers. Okay? But then he says, by this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. So we understand that, look, if we love God, part of that is keeping his commandments. In fact, over in 2 John, um, only one chapter, verse number 6, it says, And this is love, that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment that you've heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. This is what love is, walking after his commandments. And if you say you want to love God, you've got to love your brothers and sisters in Christ. You, that's part of loving God. In fact, back in 1 John chapter 4, at the end of the chapter, it says, If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God, love his brother also. Important thing. Okay? That means we have to love our brothers and sisters in Christ, even if we don't like them. Even, even if they're persecuting us. Even if they're doing bad things about us. If they say bad things about us, we must love them. And if we don't, that means we don't love God because he told us to. Pretty straightforward. Okay? Back in Matthew chapter number 22. Matthew chapter number 22, verse number 41. Matthew 22, verse 41. <clears throat> While the Pharisees were gathered together, <coughs> Jesus asked them, saying, What think you of Christ? Whose son is he? They say unto him, The son of David. He saith unto them, How then doth David in spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. 
If David then call him Lord, how is he his son? And no man was able to answer him a word, neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. So, they're confused here. Because the scripture, the scripture sometimes says things that are a bit hard to understand. I mean, they say, look, he says, look, what do you think of Christ? Whose son is he? They say, look, he's the son of David. Because they know, you know, that's the Messiah, he's going to be the son of David. And he says, well, then how then does David in the spirit, in other words, not David's word, but in the, you know, in the Psalms when he's prophesying, preaching God's word, how does he say, the Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David calls him Lord, how's he your son? And they're like, well, I'm not sure. What's going on there? And obviously it's because Jesus, you know, he's, he's the root and the offspring of David. He's both, you know, the bright morning star. But the fact is there are things that are difficult to understand in the Bible. It says in second chapter, sorry, second Peter chapter 3, verse 16, second Peter 3, 16, or maybe in verse 15, an account of the long suffering of our Lord of salvation, even as a beloved brother Paul, also according to wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, or all his letters, speaking them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest or twist, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. So there are some things hard to be understood. It's important we understand that there are things that are hard to be understood. But we need to accept what the Bible says, whether it's easy to understand or not. Now, <clears throat> there's been a lot of talk lately about the Trinity in certain Baptist circles. Okay, Now, I'm not preaching about it tonight. I will in the future. But the Trinity is a concept that there are three persons in the Godhead. Okay, 1 John 5, 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. Okay? Many references throughout the scripture talk about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. I mean, we're in Matthew 22. Look at Matthew chapter 28, probably one of the most famous ones. Matthew chapter um, 28, <coughs> verse number 19 says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. And you see this over and over. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. We saw him in 1 John. You know, I mean, you can think of maybe even think about Jesus' baptism. At Jesus' baptism, the Holy Ghost descends like a dove, and the, spa, the Father speaks to him out of heaven. You know, so we see the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, all in, all in one sort of thing. Now, clearly, there are three. Clearly, there are three. That's what 1 John 5, 7 says. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. So some people will try to deny the threeness of God. Okay? Now, it's a plain scripture that there's... A, there's a threeness of God. God is, is, is like a triune being, or the, the Trinity, or whatever you want to call it. Okay, but is it is it, is it an easy thing to understand? It, it's not an easy thing to understand. In fact, it actually says in First Timothy chapter number three, verse sixteen. First Timothy three sixteen says, that "Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh." justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto Gentiles, believed on the world, received up into glory. He says, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Okay? It's not something that's really... So, I mean, the, 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 the idea of God becoming a man, God being manifested, is that an easy thing to understand or is it difficult? It, it's hard to understand. How could God, who is you know, unlimited in power and everything else, how could he become a man who got tired? How could he become a man who didn't know everything? I mean, Jesus, he said, you know, that we talked about he, he didn't know about when he's going to come back. He says, the angels didn't know, not even the Son knows about it. How, he limited himself. And that's what he did. He became, but he's still God. He was still God. Okay? And so it's important that we, when the Bible says it, we need to understand it. I mean, you can see the Trinity taught. I mean, you can even go right back into Genesis chapter number one. Let us make man in our image. Let us make man in our image. You can't deny that God is three without ignoring countless plain scriptures. But, at the same time, the Bible says these three are one. Now we need to understand this. God is one. He is three, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, but he's also one. Galatians 3.20 says, God is one. If you ever hear someone saying, God is one, God is one, in a mocking way, there's something wrong with that. Because God is one. The Bible says God is one. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 5 says, One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. We need to understand, God is three. Don't forget that. God is one. 
Don't forget that. It's both of those. Actually, turn to John chapter number 17. John chapter number 17. John chapter number 17. Because I've heard some really silly things being said in Baptist circles recently. John chapter 17, verse number 1. <coughs> John chapter 17, verse number 1. It says, These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. So notice here, Jesus is praying to the Father. God, you know, Jesus who is God, he's praying to the Father who is God. Okay, clearly we can see there's a distinction here. But notice this though, verse 3. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, Who's he talking to? The Father. The only true God. And Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Now notice that. What does he call the Father? He says the Father is the only true God. Doesn't he? Jesus says the Father is the only true God. What that means is that, because some people have this idea, they say Jesus and the Father. Now, are Jesus and the Father, are they distinct? Are they, are they separate in the sense that they, we see them doing different things and having different roles? We have it like a chain of authority. You know, the, the Son was subject unto the Father. We see all that sort of stuff. But some people will say that the Father is God and the Son is God, but the Father is not the Son. Well, notice what it says here. He's talking to the Father. He says they might, that they might know thee, the only true God. So the Father is the only true God. If Jesus is not the Father, what is he not? He's not the only true God. So the fact is, is Jesus the Father? Because this is what a lot of people are saying lately. Jesus is not the Father. Jesus is the Father. It's right there. It's as clear as the nose on your face. You know? and, there's, and there's a lot of Baptists who they don't really know much Scripture. They're making all sorts of noise on social media, saying, I've got the Trinity nailed down. They have this traditional Trinity diagram. You know, God in the middle, and you've got, you've got the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, and it's like, you know, the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Ghost is God, but Jesus is not the Father, the Father is not the Holy Ghost, like, that sort of thing. And the fact is, that Trinity diagram does not make, match the Scripture. Now, do I have a problem if someone denies the Trinity you, to say they're not three? I have a problem with that, absolutely, I do. But I also have a problem if someone denies that God is one. God is one, the Bible clearly says. I, mean, I was watching this, this well, listening to this lady, she was saying, she makes a lot of noise about the Trinity, you know, and, um, but basically, a lot of stuff she's saying is, is, is many, it's, it's, it's not good what she's saying. But she was actually asking people, having, she says, has a lot to say for herself, but then she actually said, I'm busy reading through Isaiah, and I'm up to chapter number 11. Have a look at Isaiah, chapter number 11. Isaiah chapter number 11. Because this is someone, she's, oh yeah, uh, the Trinity that, and the oneness this, and she's, she said about Isaiah chapter number 11. She was reading this. Isaiah chapter 11, verse number 1 says, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and shall make him of quick understanding and the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither approve after hearing his ears, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reign. So notice, it's talking about who's this? This is like someone's going to come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse and a branch. This is related to what we are talking about before, about some, because Jesse was you know, David's father. And so it's the same sort of thing. He's, he's, this is who's going to come out. And this is talking about Jesus. Okay? And it says he's going he's to... Um, He's going to smite the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips, he shall slay the wicked. And there's many, we won't bother turning, there's many references talking about that. But this lady was saying, so now, who's this talking about? She said, is this Jesus? And she, you know, she was asking. And that's fine. But I mean, does someone can read this and not know that it's talking about Jesus? Is this someone who should presume to correct other people's doctrine? No, they shouldn't. You know, Isaiah chapter 9, verse number 6. Isaiah chapter 9, verse number 6 is a very clear scripture. Isaiah chapter 9, verse number 6 says, For unto us a child is born. This is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. And every, every saved believer believes that. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called. What's the name of this child? What's he called? Wonderful. Counselor. The mighty God. The everlasting Father. The Prince of Peace. So is this child, 
Is he wonderful? Yes, he is. Is he the counsellor? Yes, he is. Is he the mighty God? Yes, he is. Is he the everlasting Father? Yes, he is. And he's also the Prince of Peace. Okay, it's important to understand that. Is it true to say Jesus is a Father? Of course it is. Now, is there a distinction between them as well? Of course it is. Because remember, there are three that be record in heaven. The Father, Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three. There are three. But these three are one. It's both. Now, can we really understand that with our finite human minds? No. And people that claim that they do, they go off into all sorts of bizarre and wacky doctrines. Okay? The concept of the three persons is clearly taught, but so is the concept of one person. I mean, people will say, they'll say talking about, I mean, think about the examples we used before. You know, let us make man in our image. That's clearly showing the plurality, if you like, the, within the Godhead. But how many times does the Bible talk about God and it uses something like I or myself? Obviously. You know, in fact, which one does it use more? It uses I or myself more. I mean, we're there in Isaiah. Have a look at Isaiah chapter number, chapter number 44. Chapter number 44. <laughs> chapter number 44. You see, we, we understand that the creator is Jesus Christ. John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. It says, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Jesus Christ is the creator. He was in the world, the world was made by him. And the world knew him not. Clearly, Jesus Christ is creator. Well, notice what it says here in Isaiah chapter 44 and verse number 24. It says, Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb, I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. So was it done? That's singular. That is clearly singular. And these people say, well, of Jesus, and you point to a place where Jesus is separate from the Father. Obviously, because he's three. But he's also one. Okay, and so to go off on either extreme is, is bad. Now, do people get mixed up on it and it's, you know, yeah, sure they do. Why? Because it's a difficult thing. But that's why people shouldn't say things and try and make out that they understand things when really they don't. Okay? Um, there's lots of other places we could go to. I mean, that's probably one of the best one of the best things to do. In fact, this is where I came to understand this years and years ago. And um, was <coughs> coming across Jehovah's Witnesses. And not because they hit you with the say, oh, Jesus is not really God, he's dark. And so what do you see? So go back to the Bible. So well, they're telling me these things, let's have a look and see what it does. And so you search through the scriptures and you discover all these things that are attributed to God the Father that are also attributed to Jesus. I mean, I mean, who is the Saviour? If you read the book of Isaiah, in fact, we're there in Isaiah, look at chapter 43. Isaiah chapter 43. When it says Lord here, Isaiah chapter 43, verse page 743. Verse number 10 says, Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord. And see that capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D? That's the, that's the, the I think it's called the tetragrammaton, you know? That's Jehovah, Jehovah God. That's what it's saying. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I've chosen, that ye may know and believe me, and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Saviour. He says, I'm the Saviour. Jehovah, God, is a saviour. I have declared and have saved and I have showed when there was no strange God among you. Therefore, ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. He's not saying we are God, is he? He's saying I am God. Yea, before the day was, I am he. And there is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work and who shall let it? Thus saith the Lord your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, for your sake I have sent to Babylon and have brought down all their nobles and the Chaldeans whose cries in the ships. Look at this. I am the Lord your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. That's really clear. You know, you can look, we won't bother going there, look in Titus, Titus chapter number 1. In Titus chapter number 1, it says God is a Saviour, and it says Jesus Christ is a Saviour. In Titus chapter number 2, it says God is a Saviour, and Jesus Christ is a Saviour. In Titus chapter 3, it says God is a Saviour, and Jesus Christ is a Saviour. In all three chapters, it says it both times. He is the Saviour, but we know there's only one Saviour. There's only one Saviour. And it's the Lord Jesus Christ. It's important we understand that. People end up going into, into error. Turn back to Matthew chapter 22. People go into error because they don't know the scriptures. They don't know the scriptures. Matthew chapter 22, verse number 29. Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. That's why people go in error. It's, it's why it's so important. That's why, we, that's why we're doing the Bible much. We want you to read the Bible. Because as you read the Bible... You know, we talked about that earlier on. It's little by little, line upon line, precept upon precept. We learn these things, and then when someone tries to lead us away into false doctrine and they say something, immediately it pops into my hang on, but the Bible says this. 
hang on, but the Bible says this. Hang on, and, and that's what the Bible says. In fact, I said it was last place, but look at Ephesians. That's what God wants. He, he wants us to learn. He wants us to grow. Ephesians chapter number 4. Ephesians chapter number 4. This is, what, this is one of the reasons why God is... That's why, why, one of the reasons it's important to come to church. Um, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11 says that he gave some apostles... Some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. It's to make the saints perfect, to, to help them to learn, help them to grow. For the work of the ministry, so they'll be able to do the work that God's called them to do. For the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith. And of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. So he says, we don't want to be children. Because the thing about children is you can fool them. You tell them something, oh, they believe that. You tell them something else, oh, they believe that. No, we shouldn't be children. We should grow up. Now, when someone's first saved, they are, they're a babe in Christ. That's normal to not have a huge amount of knowledge. But the fact is, God wants us to grow the Bible says, but grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. He wants us to grow so that we won't be deceived. In fact, I think we might even be, did we sing it earlier on? We sang Stephen John, didn't we? Yeah, many deceivers are entering the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. He says, no, don't be deceived by these people. Is there a danger of being deceived by them? Yes. He says, look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. You know? So it's, it's, it's so important, so important. And that's one of the reasons also why we sing the scripture. That's why we sing chapters of the Bible. Every service we sing chapters of the Bible because it, that's how we, God's word goes into our heart. And then we suddenly, I mean, I was talking to one of my girls the other day, we, we've been singing Proverbs chapter 23. Well, not must have been Proverbs chapter 7, sorry, Proverbs chapter 7. And it talks about this woman in here and it describes this, this strange woman, you know, this, this, you know the woman in the, with the attire of a harlot. And it says about her, she is loud and stubborn. You know, and obviously, the, if you read through Proverbs 7, it paints a really bad picture of this, of this woman. But it says she's loud and stubborn. And so one of my daughters said to my other daughter, don't be loud and stubborn. Don't be loud and stubborn. Yeah, well, that's right, because the Bible says the woman is supposed to have a meek and quiet spirit. Don't be loud and stubborn. Okay? And that, and that it was actually the four-year-old that said it. That had gone into her heart, and it came out of her mouth, you know? And so it's, it's important that we understand these things, that we, that we ground ourselves in the truth. That we ground ourselves in the truth. Because then when you hear someone say something, and it's like, hang on, but that can't be right. Hang on, but that can't be right. And it's, it's so important, I, I can't stress it enough. He says, you do err not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. And on all the errors that we saw in this chapter, right from the people who, you know, they, they wanted their own righteousness, didn't they? They wanted their own righteousness to be saved by that. They were an error. Okay, if they'd known what the scriptures say, the scriptures make it really clear. You know, all these different things, the, 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 the mistake about thinking that, you know, there's going to be marriage in heaven. No, got to know the scriptures, you know, um, and even understand, well, how could, how could, you know, how could Christ be the, be the son of David and also the Lord of it? How could that be? It's the scriptures. The scriptures are what we need to know. Let's uh, close in prayer. <coughs> Gracious Lord, we thank you for your word and thank you for the precious gift of your word. Lord, so many people throughout history, people haven't had your word, your entire word that we can take around with us and, and have it with us. They, you know, it was, we're such a blessed generation. I mean, we even have it on a, an electronic device. We can look up and search anything. Help us to take advantage of it. Help us to, to study your word, to read your word. Not to waste our time, um, you know, on Facebook. Not to waste our time reading unprofitable things that won't help. Help us to have a love for your word, a hunger for your word, to believe your word and just to, to follow your word. Lord, we, we thank you and praise you and love you. In Jesus' precious name, amen.